I haven't I haven't done that kind of statistic, but I don't think so. Um, if anything, is probably heavier on the 16th and 17th century than it is for the 20th century, uh, but it's pretty evenly distributed. And I, I, but I haven't done an actual cult, uh, count of them, but um, it's pretty well balanced. So you, whatever you're looking for in any century, you have a good chance of finding something there. But this data does stop about 1980s, 90, early 90s, so, because that's when it was produced, right? So it, it stops there. But until we get new data, and people send us new data. Um, only thing is, you go to the contact and you send it to me because I don't want anyone. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. yeah. I I am the sole keeper of the grail, so to speak. Just um, so, uh, and even I had tremor at the thought of going in there and changing data. And I cr I write down everything I've changed in case something goes awry, right? And I do. We do have backups everywhere, but but you can go to the contact and send me any information, uh, and and we will we will keep adding it. But we need, and then if I'm missing, you know, day, name, date, place, I can, I can contact the person and get whatever we need. Because we're hoping it will grow, and that's the importance of it also being online. And to make it open to absolutely anyone. Of course, the copyright is by the Hispanic Seminary, and we hope everybody will um, remind, remember to put that footnote in there. But. I, there is not a process for that except they send me the information and I check to see. We haven't had, it's so new we haven't had that yet, but I would check to see that we've got it or not and then add it in. Um, I don't have an automated process for that, but I would assume people would only send and we would hope. Um, but as we, get, as, we get, as we get going, maybe another, another help guide or another, another tab for, for submissions. With it. Good idea. We, mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Are there limitations on the the sources that can be used in copyright No, as long as we as long as you cite where it's coming from and where you got it and it's not folios worth of reproduction. There, there aren't, it's just like any article. You can cite it as long as you say where you got it. And, if you, and we do and have always, even on the earlier projects, um, when we give attribution, we give is the complete bibliographic information, uh, author, editors, everything else. So, every, and so everyone is, it's, it's, it's fully attributed as should be for copyright laws. And we're only, usually this, we don't have a large enough I mean, we could put in very large citations, but you only really need enough to clarify what you have. And then, as I say, thanks to Google, a lot of these things, which are very old text, if you want more, you can very easily now, just with a click of the Google search, find that text and read more. Because this is not necessarily to give you chapters of things. This is to give you a sense of, and that was Boyd Bowman's original attention, and a very good one, I guess, to give you a sense of the context, the meaning, the grammar, you know, and whatever you need to get the right, a certain, the sense of that word. Sometimes I wish he would have done a little bit more on context, but we're not going to go back to, there, there literally are like citations, there are like 40,000 of them. Um, more than that, there's, there's 80,000 head words and there's something like 400,000 citations. So that's a lot to go back and try to add in information. But as we go forward, we can make larger citations. Yeah. Well, we've sent it around to the, and to, thanks to Fernando, we sent it around to the open access information and to a linguist's uh, uh, info link. 
so that the linguists know what's out there. We sent it around to listservs to um, various medievalist as well as um, uh, European Hispanist groups. Um, we've been trying to get it linked onto other digital resource pages. So it's now linked on uh, the University of Valencia's Hispanic resource pages. We're trying to get it linked up to the Hispanic Seminary page, which is fairly known. So we're trying to get it linked as much as we can. And if you Google, yes. Yes, it's live, and if you Google, that's Pablo Ancos, who also helped with some of the editorial. He can never remember the link. He always has to Google it. So if you Google it, you get it. Um, you get it. Um, and as I say, it's, it's, um, we're trying to get the word out as much as possible. Uh, and this was one way of letting the university community know that we have this available, and, and for Latin Americanists especially, it, it, thinking in cultural studies, even for literature people, thinking for historians, thinking for linguists, um, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of plant information out there. There are things in plants and trees, I don't even know how to pronounce the names. So there's also a lot of agriculture out there, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of fruits out there. I, you know, we call this this, we drink this, we, I don't know what all. I'm not trying to make fun of it, it's, but it's really interesting and it's fun, right? And there's names, I have no idea what these things are, except they're either a tree, a plant, or a food. Um, because I, I'm just not familiar enough with that world, right? So even for, for people interested in agriculture, in, in, in all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You can search on a word, and you can, and, and of course you have to understand, as you do know, that uh, the orthography back in the older centuries is, is variable. So you either have to use, and there, I'm, if you, there's wild cards, so that you can, instead of you putting a U or a V, you can put in a wild card. It's kind of like what you, but if you've ever used word, uh, word searches with wild cards, it's very similar to that. So what you'd have to do, for example, um, and I think I used, you have to do wildcard searches um, and, some, and some multiple searches. In other words, if you want to find all the verb forms of, right? Um, because under the verb infinitive, you'll get a select group. But that's, the head word it represents what Boyd Bowman thought was the essence of that citation. And your verb form may not have been the essence of that citation. So you have to do a word search. And I can't remember if I was looking at one for an example. Um, but um, but you, have to, you, have to pick your, you have to pick your forms. Um, for example, you can do that and you'll come up with, oh, but that's in that text. You have to remember to clear all your you can come up with 154 results, but then you'd have to remember to either use a wild card, right, for the U or the V. And there are, and under the help guides, and I don't have them all in my little brain at the moment, but under the help guides, they give some examples of that, of how you can use wild cards. You, we, don't have an, we don't have a Boolean, but we, can, we have some wild cards that do something very close. And again, that's something that is just going to take a little patience. There's no way of predicting all the, you know, the verb forms, all the orthographic variations of that. But with some of the wild cards, you can come very quickly. And I don't remember, I had one example in there. Um, I don't have it on the top of my head, but here, for example, for, use, for using the for fue, for fuere, and you can use a wild card to try to get, you're going to get fuese, fuere, etc. Okay. Yeah. And if you read the help guides and the wild cards and play around with it, but you can you can get very very close. But we, it was a thin budget, and we had. Needless to say, and so we had to use the free version of my, my sequel. 
And that doesn't have all the whistles and bells of the version you buy. But we didn't have the money to buy it. So we're, we're using the, the, the poor man's version. And it has a limited number of wild cards. OK. But it was free. I, I'm not sure how to do that within the university budgetary rules and regulations. I think that might be really hard. I would like to think I could get myself rich, but I <laughs> But no, for the project. Well, let's hope I find a rich donor who'd like to give the project through the foundation a whole lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but, but as with all of these things, they're very important. And even trying to get the money, you don't know how many grant proposals I had to write just to get the money to try to get this much done. Uh, and that was very thin budget with the help of one undergraduate computer science and my doing most of the work. And having to pay do it for a server, which is another conversation. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's just very hard. And then to sustain, the problem is then sustain it. So as long as I'm breathing, I'll keep this working. But then we have to think, you know, I've, someday somebody else is going to have to keep this technology keeps changing. Somebody has to, the database sometimes will need to be changed. The server will be upgraded. Things will happen. So that's always a problem with the digital humanities and all, all technology. As things change, you have to keep maintaining it. You have to move with the new changes to the server, to the database, to whatever. But this really is a cool project. And this really is a great database. And it's got a lot of information. So I'm hoping that this will be the first, you know, first attempt within the university community to let everybody know it's out there. And just in case you wanted to see a little bit more, we can come back to this, but I'll show you the chivalry corpus, which I told you about, which is something I'm very, very interested in. But it not only has, and we're continuing to upload not only new texts, um, but we also, when possible, with the permission of libraries, are also doing images. So we also try to produce the images as well as the text, so people can see what the texts look like. And some of the, especially with the Historia de la Linda Menocina, which is a water sprite, uh, type of mermaid character. There's great, great illustrations in that book. So we're trying to also preserve and get people to absolutely actually see the originals of these things as well as the text. Um, so that's just for your information. Um, they're great things, but you do know why Don Quixote went mad after you read several of these. <laughs> Especially when you get into like the 10th and 11th book of the Amadis cycle. It gets a little strange. So you, you know how it all affected his thinking and dried up his wits. But it, the Lessico is something that really finally really is important to have everybody able to access it. Buttons for adding is, is a great suggestion to get people to add in to get new data. Anything else? It was, um, it was the essence of what was the reputation of the Spanish uh, in, in Madison. Uh, it started basically when uh, Solalinde came over after the, uh, after the Civil War uh, from Spain and uh, started up a seminario in the, in, the, um, in the Spanish tradition of the equipo, right, working in equipo. And it worked with Back then, of course, in the 30s, what you did was you had, for, they started working mostly on the Alfonsin prose and working on a dictionary of the old Spanish language. And Mary Lou worked on that with cutting up, you'd have multiple volumes of the same text and they would just cut it up into fichitas and you'd underscore the words. And I think it was in the year 19, 90, 1995, we finally threw away rooms full of these fichas that were no longer so the pro original project and the essence of the seminary was the Dictionary of the Old Spanish Language, which still lives on under the guidance of Paco Gago at Holy Cross, um, who also has the, most of the seminary text, uh, computerized text online. 
Um, and Lloyd Caston was, took over from Sololinde, being a disciple of Sololinde, kept the seminary going, working on the main project of the Dictionary of the Old Spanish Language, uh, which appeared as in, the, in his first form of the Alfonsin, Dictionary of the Alfonsin Prose, uh, in 2002, two or three mm -hmm. volumes in print. It's a project that's still ongoing, but as in any project, like the Oxford English Dictionary, it's a thing that never stops. But John Nitty, in the late 70s, was on, really was the cutting edge of what was then computing in the humanities. And realized that in order to do these things, you needed to use computers. And so at that point, all the paper fichitas uh, were no longer really needed. Uh, the texts were input by many people, including me, to keystroking texts into computer files, into straight standard ASCII text. Who, we had programs then which produced, um, which actually was the beginning, if you know anything about the TEI, the Text uh, Encoding Initiative, they modeled their text encoding after the seminary, because it, it was the pioneer in doing that. And it put the dictionary, and even helped the, uh, the American Regional Dictionary, help them get them established into computerization and put that all online. But in order to do that, you needed your data to be in electronic format. So all of those old manuscripts had to be keystroked into computer files. And there's no way to scan those. We can still keep trying. There's absolutely no, the, the variation in either handwriting for manuscripts or the font from early texts, printed texts, is absolutely, by the time you teach the scanner to read it, you could have keystroked it in. So there's really no shortcut to that. And even today, you need to keystroke in a text. So the Hispanic Seminary then branched off not only from the dictionary project, but to creating computerized text, which is where I entered in in the early 80s and started to work in that, that field, as well as some computerized lexicography, which Fernando still, still works on and, and, and does as part of his research. The Hispanic Seminary thus was, was really key, cutting edge, digital, with now digital humanities for computerized lexicography, computerized text and editions, um, and such, and, and corpora, linguistic and other data corpora. Um, and it moved to the Hispanic Society of America in the year 2000, where the head of the, now the head of the seminary is John O'Neill, one of our PhDs, who's also the director and uh, curator of manuscripts and old books at the Hispanic Society of America. And Paco Gago works on putting a lot of this stuff online, who is also one of our graduates. Uh, he's now a professor at Holy Cross. And uh, works also with keeping some of the dictionary project alive. So that's, Wisconsin should be very proud of its, of its um, history in the computing in the humanities uh, and computerized lexicography and what it has done for uh, Hispanic studies in general. And they published a lot of things in the Latin America area as well. Any other questions? Please go out and, if you have any interest, go out and play, out and play with it. Um, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of funky things in it. Um, and if you find any errors, let me know. I'm correcting the database. Um, but it is very, it's got a lot of very interesting things in there. And especially if you're interested in flora and fauna. Canoes, um, a lot of things about canoes. Um, if not, thank you very much and go out and enjoy the day. It's a beautiful day.